today, good afternoon guys, we're going to be traveling into the future about 20 years, okay? So imagine yourself in the year 2036, you are press affiliates inside of the NASA Kennedy Space Center newsroom, right? And we are doing a pre-launch news conference for astronaut Jillian Gloria, one of the first members of the crew for the first manned mission to Mars, okay? The background, <clears throat> humanity is sending the first humans to Mars to further explore our past in hopes that we shall ascertain our future. By examining the Martian terrain and its geological history, we hope to learn more about why and why, how it wound up a desiccated, inhospitable world. Okay, so now we can begin the time. <clears throat> Good afternoon, thanks for joining us here today at the NASA Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. We are excited, we're excited to have a member of the Ares um, 3 crew with us. She is readying for the historic launch of the first manned mission to Mars, launching in November in 2036. I would like to start off, I would like to start our news conference by presenting our um, prime crew member, flight engineer Jillian Gloria. Jillian was elected in July 2030 as first of 14 members of the 35th NASA astronaut class. Her training included scientific and technical briefing, intensive instruction uh, in Orion spacecraft systems, spacewalks, robotics, and physiological training, T-38 flight training, and water and wilderness survival training. We'll take the first question now. Have you always known that you wanted to be an astronaut? Thank you, Ivy. First, I'd like to say that it is a great privilege to be here representing the next generation of space exploration. So for me, growing up in Orlando, Florida, I feel that I was given the opportunity that some can only dream of. That is, being able to witness firsthand the beauty of space exploration, as I got to watch the space shuttle launch humans into orbit from my own backyard. <clears throat> It was this constant exposure to engineering brilliancy and human collaboration which led me to believe that one day I too could become part of this incredible program of manned space flight. I cannot pinpoint the exact moment when I made a conscious decision to become an astronaut, but I always knew that I wanted to go into space. There has always been a yearning inside of me, a desire to contribute to the advancement of mankind's footprints in the solar system. I know that it is my purpose in life, a purpose that has led me every day and every decision that I have made. From my education to my career path, this purpose has guided my life. So how did you turn this dream of yours into reality? What type of qualifications must, have to be, must you have to become an astronaut? So I'll start off with the basic requirements um, that the NASA, NASA Astronaut Corps looks for in its applicants. One is a bachelor's degree from an accredited university uh, with an engineering, a biological science, physical science, or mathematics degree. Continuing on, NASA Astronaut Corps look for at least 1,000 hours of pilot and command flight time and also the ability to pass a NASA physical, which is similar to a military physical, which includes the following specifications. A distant visual activity of not just 2020, but 20 uh, over 100. A sitting blood pe pressure measurement of 140 over 90, and a height between 62 and 75 inches. When I was about 17 years old, I remember touring Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and it was always my first choice because I knew that a great number of astronauts had graduated from that university, and I knew that if that was the career path I wished to embark upon, that is where I needed to be. Unfortunately, I could not afford Embry-Riddle for my undergraduates, so I began pursuing my degree at Valencia. They had an AA with an articulated engineering track toward the University of Central Florida, which was a guaranteed acceptance program into said university. So I continued on to UCF, where I obtained my bachelor's in aerospace engineering. At that 
time, I was also enrolled in the ROTC program at UCF, so that when I graduated, I would be an officer ranking in the U.S. Air Force. After my bachelor's, I then served six years in the U.S. Air Force, where I gained experience as a pilot. And after my six years term, I was able to use my GI Bill to pay for my master's degree in engineering physics at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. In the year 2030, I was accepted into the NASA Astronaut Corps, where I have spent the past six years training uh, for this mission. How much was the financial cost of your education? Can you break it down for the viewers at home thinking to themselves that they can never afford to be an astronaut? And could you give some advice to those who think that they aren't smart enough? Of course, that's a great question. But first, I would like to say and emphasize that you should never sell yourself short. Take it from me. At first, I couldn't afford to pay for a private university. So I started off at a community college and spent about $9,400 on my AAs for an out-of-state tuition resident. And continuing on to my bachelor's, I only paid about $6,400. And like I stated previously, my master's degree was completely covered by my GI Bill. So there are ways to obtain your goals in life if you do not have the money. There are a lot of different scholarships, a lot of different opportunities. Ms. Goyer, you are the flight engineer of the first manned mission to Mars. Can you tell us a little about the duties you will be responsible for executing? Absolutely. So I like to think of a flight engineer as uh, our duties including almost everything on the spacecraft. So from assisting the pilot and commander to keeping track of information relayed, uh, relayed from CAPCOM, we have an overall responsibility for the coordination of the spacecraft systems. We must have a detailed knowledge of the operational characteristics, mission requirements, and objectives, as well as the ability to support systems for each payload element. Flight engineers are also responsible for performing extravehicular activities, which are the fun parts in my opinion. Extravehicular activities are any activity that is performed outside of the spacecraft. So for our Mars mission, I will, be, can, I will be working with our commander in order to collect all of the Martian samples from the territory in which we land. What are some examples of the necessary workforce skills an astronaut needs to have? Some of the workforce skills that I've noticed are very predominant in this industry uh, include those of integrity, judgment, reasoning, the ability to synthesize and communicate using plain language, public speaking, teamwork, motivation, and resourcefulness. What are two things that you've learned from previous mentor or colleagues? So two things that have always stuck with me through the years um, is that you must always be passionate. You must already be passionate. And whatever career industry you try to find your way into, you must have a previous passion in order to succeed. And secondly, you must always focus your energy to accomplish the task, the task at hand. Okay, so those are some great questions from our press affiliates and social media counterparts. We want to thank you, Julian, and thank you everybody for joining us today. That's going to wrap up our briefing for today and a reminder for everyone that you can find out more information about NASA's journey to Mars at www nasa.gov slash journey to Mars. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. So I have some questions to ask you guys. And if you get it right, you get a cool NASA sticker, okay? So does anybody know how many people have flown in space? Total. If you want to do it. You can take a guess. The closest one will get Higher or lower? Yeah. Higher. 64. Oh, higher? 74. Flown in space. 
I said, oh, I did 300. 300, you're the closest. The total amount of people or humans who have ever flown into space, 536 today. Wow. wow. That's amazing. Or just, uh, That's throughout the world. Cool. So including uh, European Space Agency, nice. the Russian cosmonauts, and That's all. Yeah. 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 Like trying to break it down people yeah. nationally or like yep. <laughs> Okay. Who knows how many planets we have in our solar system? Eight. Nine. Who prefers? Nine. No, we have nine. Technically, Pluto is oh, uh, considered a planet. You have to raise your hand, yes. kids. Pluto's a planet. There's not in it now. Poor Pluto. No. Next. What? Isn't Pluto still. It it is. Isn't it a planet it again? Planet. Planet. Right. It's a planet. Right. Right. I mean, they took it away, but I hope they think, like, give no. back. Like, yeah. Who said eight? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's eight. We used to have nine back when we were in elementary school, but Pluto is now actually classified as a dwarf planet. So there are a lot of different kinds of planets each day. Oh, it's, 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 it's a dwarf planet. There's definitely a difference. NASA has actually found over thousands of planets that can host life. And those are inclusive of habitable planets like Earth with water and oxygen and also dwarf planets. So dwarf planets are just a little bit bigger than comets and asteroids and things like that. So they can't technically be classified as an asteroid. So we call them dwarf planets. Pluto. Yeah, fair <laughs> so, who knows what the average length of a day is on Mars? We call it a sol. Uh, it's, it's one that goes like, I don't, I'm sorry. No, go on to somebody else, I don't remember. It was like Anybody have a guess? 40 hours? 36 hours. 30. 50, 56 hours. It's actually 24 hours and 40 minutes, so close to 25 hours. So that's mm -hmm. why we call it a sol, because it's just a little bit longer than an Earth day. You can get a participation certificate. Yay! <laughs> Yay, participation. I, I'll accept it. I didn't really get a, a chance to talk about like the actual journey to Mars because it was tough. So, if you guys have any questions, please ask. Uh, I don't know. Yes. Um, just the idea of embarking on becoming an astronaut, let alone, let alone embarking on journey to Mars, um, going through school, was there any type of assistance that you got from any of the universities? That In what you? sense? Resources. Yes, I know I skipped over that. <laughs> yes, so I was actually going to mention, uh, if you're ever feeling not smart enough to pursue your dreams, I'd like to state that there are a lot of intelligent people in the world who feel the same way you do. But the way that they get over it or uh, find a way to deal with that insecurity is actually being able to practice and communicate their findings and their education uh, to other people. So I know for myself, I basically lived in the math tutoring center or the physics tutoring center or the chemistry tutoring center, any kind of tutoring that I needed in a subject that I didn't excel in or I wasn't satisfactory to my standards, um, I received tutoring. So it's okay to ask for help. A lot of our greatest uh, minds in this world, besides those who are truly brilliant, like Einstein, have gotten help from others. Uh, greatest fear, if any, of going to space or time? I don't know. Greatest fear? If you have any at all. Would be not going at all. Okay. My greatest fear would be not going <laughs> yes. How long, how long is your journey going to take you there and back? That's a great question. Um, so the average journey that, looks, uh, that it looks like right now is about 1,100 days. So it'll take about four to six uh, months to get to Mars, uh, where we would spend an average about 30 sols on the actual surface, collecting samples and conducting research, and then another four to six months on the way home. That's crazy. Yeah. I guess I knew that from watching the movie with Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great awesome. movie, and actually, oh, eighty percent of that it, is it actually true. How they, so, yeah. Anyway, Andy Weir and the cool. production company actually worked with NASA throughout the entirety of the movie and production um, in order to make it the most scientifically accurate space movie ever. Mm. Yes. What do you guys eat? 
like on your way to Mars. <laughs> I mean, it's like so NASA, many, many, there's a lot of different kinds of jobs at NASA. Awesome. There's not just astronauts, there's not just engineers, there's not just rocket science. We have PR, we have chefs, we have all different kinds of um, job opportunities. Okay, it is an entire company. So for astronaut food, it was really cool. I was actually mentioning this before our press conference. Um, there's actually a whole department that studies what kind of food can go into space, um, the process that it takes to actually make it space flight ready, so the dehydration of all the elements. And there are different competitions that are held uh, on the national level or uh, from a private contractor industry uh, where you can compete with other chefs around the nation and or contractors to be selected. So they'll have actual, actual astronauts who are taste the food or national, NASA officials. So it's a really complex um, side of NASA that no one actually really knows too much about. So you're getting actual food with the pills or whatever? Yeah, so with actual them. food. So what they do is they dehydrate the food and they put it in bags so it lasts uh, longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when they get to space, some of the food, they actually rehydrate it with water. So you just add water and voila. Any more questions? Thank you for your time. Oh, okay.